Hello, everyone. It's really terrific to be here today, and I hope you enjoyed this TEDx event as much as I do. Now, I don't know about your experience, but when I get to, new, get, get to meet new people, like in this event here or at a dinner party, the conversation sooner or later turns into each other's jobs, right? And then I get asked, so what's your job about? What are you doing? And then I, I pause. And I really have to think how to best explain what am I doing. I certainly love my job. I'm feeling absolutely privileged being able to do what I'm doing. And it's the most interesting, fascinating, diverse, interdisciplinary, meaningful, but yet challenging work I have ever been dreaming about. I am a biobanker. And we heard there is quite often some misunderstanding. No, I'm not a banker, I'm a biobanker. And even so, there might be common concepts. The focus of biobanking is absolutely different one. And luckily we have TEDx, because now I can explain in more detail what it really means and what biobanking means to each one of you, us, and the world all over. And that's what I'd like to showcase in the next few minutes to you. Now let's start thinking of what really a biobank is, the concept of it, and think about what is the most precious item you think of. I'm not talking about your wife, your husband, children, family, relatives. No, maybe it's a watch you inherited from your granddad, or it is jewelry you obtained as a gift from a special person. You certainly want to keep that precious item safe, protected, and you also do want to know where it is at all times, just to be sure it's there, right? And that's the concept that biobanks also, also bring about. So they safeguard very precious samples and associated data. They protect them, they preserve them. And in addition to that, they monitor the samples and data for their life cycle. Well, what does it mean, life cycle? Well, the biobank doesn't come with all the samples right now, and I will explain a little bit further down the road what samples can be in data. Um, but you have to obtain the data and the samples first, and then you need to process them in order to preserve the most natural state of these samples. And after processing them, you want to conserve them at that stage. And therefore, depending on the purpose later on, down the life cycle of the sample, you conserve them either at 4 degrees, at minus 20, at minus 80, or below even minus 150 Celsius degrees. And for that, we have nowadays, and you can see it behind me, basically highly automated, high throughput systems. And they not only allow to easily put the samples into this facility, but they also allow, if they are sample request, to take from different locations in this facility, samples out, bring them together, and hand them over to those ones who request it. And that's the next very specific topic of biobanks. We don't collect samples or data for our own purpose, for ourselves. No, we want to enable others to work with it, to foster research and innovation. And I think this is a very specific um, characteristics of biobankers, we actually bio-sharers. We are bio-sharing samples and data and enable others to work on those. Now, this might be a very simplistic overview of biobanking, um, and it comes more specific and de detailed if you look at the requirements that we need to tackle. There, first of all, there's biospecimen science, which means we really need to understand, to research ourselves, how to obtain a sample and preserve it the best. There's also quality management, so we need to define how best standardize our processes and how to ensure the quality of a sample now and forever, basically, and to have it comparable across different biobanks. There is also the IT infrastructure. So we need, basically, to monitor the samples and data across their life cycle, now and reliable and continuously, but we also need to connect the biobanks across the world in order to make full potential of all what we have in our biobanks. We also need equipment. Of course, we need to basically have the entire workflow covered, and sometimes we actually not only need to validate new equipment, we might even need to build new equipment because we still are in need of certain things which are not there yet. Of course, we also need to tackle healthy issues. 
This is a short abbreviation for ethics, legal and social issues. And this is basically where we need to work in adherence to ethics and legal issues and regulations. And we talk with our stakeholders and customers how this can be further developed. So we take taking the time and discuss with patients, patient representatives, with industry partners, with the public, with politicians, medical doctors, and so on, to be really developing how we can use make use of these samples further. Now you can see from all these kind of requirements that the work of a biobanker is highly interdisciplinary, right? We need to work together, and this is really interesting, but also sometimes challenging, because all of us having a different profession, be it biologists, medical doctors, veterinarians, ethicists, lawyers, physicists, IT specialists, we all speak different languages. So that's a challenge right there, how to basically make biobanks working, function, and being successful. But it comes even more tricky if you consider what kind of main domains or types of biobanks are actually out there. And this is highlighted behind me. There are hospital-integrated biobanks, there are population-based biobanks, then we have also human biomonitoring, plant biobanks, environment biobanks, domestic and wildlife biobanks, and museum biobanks. And I selected just a few examples of few of them to show you how important biobanks are for all of us and to make even the world healthier. So let's start with healthcare integrated biobanking. And it's all about the patient coming to the hospital with a specific disease. And biobanks don't care that much about routine diagnostics on samples and data. And samples can be tissue or liquid samples. So this is not what we care of, but we care about the research in order that research can improve precision medicine. And that's why they are in need of samples and data. And behind me, it shows you basically to you that for a long time, there was a real structural gap between clinical care and the research side. The samples somehow got into the research side, but we didn't know anything about the quality, how they were obtained, and data were missing most of the time. So we know today that many research projects in the past didn't come up with a meaningful conclusion because the samples were lacking quality and the results cannot be applied in the clinical side. So that what happened then is basically we have closed this gap with centralized quality certified biobanks. And it's a learning circle where basically the structural biobanks can from patient um, consenting sample collection, processing, storage, and biomaterial request basically give high quality samples and data from the clinical side to the research side, but these data also go back to the clinicians to feed into therapy guidance. And this has been obviously very important now in the COVID pandemic, where biobanks were helping on the clinical side, actually making it a little bit easier for the clinicians to collect these valuable samples from COVID patients in order to foster coming up with new diagnostic tests or developing basically vaccines. But also of course, we also support clinical trials or molecular tumor boards. And I would like to characterize a little bit what molecular tumor boards are about. So if you have a cancer patient who has failed all guideline therapies, this patient has no hope really whatsoever. So it's a life expectancy of a few weeks, months maybe. And there, there are no guideline therapies. So what the only thing you can do is basically get fresh samples, prepare them in a high quality way and for the purpose for the newest technologies in research. And then these data come back, get into systems medicine, and then we hopefully can give the molecular tumor board and the patient a therapy guidance. Now, we do this with biobanks because we know best about the sample quality and the purpose these samples are needed for. And there's one case I want to show you. Basically, it was a female patient with pancreatic cancer, one of the most devastating tumor diseases. This, pancer, uh, this cancer was basically quite advanced. This patient was not operable on and had a life expectancy of about three months. So we supported with the biobank infrastructure, getting the samples right at the or biopsy of this uh, tumor, prepared it the way that the downstream analysis could use it to the maximum 
analyzing different regulation levels and then giving the data back to systems medicine. And you can easily see, even, you, even so you're not an expert, that in the center there's one node and that reflects one gene mutation which is surrounded by many, many smaller dots, which are other genes which reflect other signaling pathways. So this one gene mutation is Achilles heel of that tumor for that particular patient. So we suggested that this patient should get a low dose routine chemotherapy in order to prevent side effects and then get an antibody therapy against this one target. So this patient surprisingly lived then not for three months, not for six months, but for two years and with quite a good life quality. So this is a success story where biobanks can play a very instrumental role and we of course need to learn from these success stories even so there are also other stories which are more sad. Um, but we need to learn together in these interdisciplinary approaches. Now, in contrast to healthcare integrated biobanks, we have population based biobanks and they work with healthy individuals. So they invite from the population healthy people to come to the biobank to get basically an analysis from top to toe. So it can be that you analyze laboratory diagnostics routinely, you do chest x ray, or you do a scan of the brain. And more and more, then we facilitate even genomics medicine. So we do genome analysis of the DNA. And by that, biobanks can support research on population-based diseases such as heart failure or diabetes. And with this genomics medicine, we can come up with even more risk assessments for this individual person to say, well, you have a high risk to develop later in life diabetes. And you might want to change the li your lifestyle in order to prevent getting diabetes. So this is another example where biobanks can be really of help and support. Now the third example of related to human health are human biomonitoring biobanks. And they try to tackle how the chemical pollution of our environment is affecting our health. And we can obtain chemical pollution through our food, through our water, by medications, by um, radiation, by smoke, and any other toxins in our environment. And I think that these human biomonitoring biobanks are still underrepresented, and this will be a field of res research where biobanks will be much more important in the near future. Of course, toxins don't only hurt us, they also hurt the plants themselves. And in order to prevent the biodiversity of plants, which can be impacted by global warming, we hear about it, it can be by monocultures, industrialization, but also toxins, they are biobanks of plants who try to preserve this biodiversity of crops by having field gene banks, by having in vitro gene banks or cryo biobanks. And you will be amazed to realize that we have more than 400 botanical gardens worldwide who basically preserve crops. And we have more than 1,700 agricultural biobanks who give basically preservation or access to more than 7 million accessions of crops. This is really amazing. But of course, there are also specific biobanks who tackle not individual like plants, but they basically try to support the entire environment research. And these are environmental biobanks and they try to understand how pollution impacting or the climate change or the melting of the polar ice is influencing our entire ecosystem or specific regions. Now, this brings me to another topic because melting of the polar ice is actually impacting the habitat of the polar bear. And um, wildlife biobanking is about preserving also biodiversity of our animals and especially those one who are endangered. And here you see on the slide behind me one of our pioneers in wildlife biobanking biopreservation who's taking a blood sample from a white rhinoceros in order to facilitate genomics medicine or medi uh, genomics research and also um, disease monitoring of this endangered species. But furthermore, wildlife biobanking means also providing siemens for breeding um, programs in cooperation with zoos where we have protected areas for these breeding processes. And 
Furthermore, this picture I love especially because it shows how we engage with the public and even educate our future generations about the challenges we have and we try to tackle today. So with this said, I hope that I could convince you that biobanking is really highly interdisciplinary, most interesting, challenging and rewarding at once, but is also able to support our world, making it healthier. I think it's really important to understand that biobanks work across the world in networks to make full use of all our collections. And I really would like to invite you also to let's make our lives healthier, make new treatments possible, but let's not forget about that we have the responsibility to protect basically all biodiversity in our world and, and our planet itself. Thank you very much for listening. If you're interested, reach out to me afterwards. Thank you.